Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Tonight we have a former Jehovah Witness. And I know a lot of you folk who watch The Journey Home a lot love to hear when, uh, not only because we've heard about the news of someone coming home to the church from Jehovah Witnesses, but we're also always wondering, well, tell us more about those Jehovah Witnesses because they, they're knocking at our door and I don't really understand what they're teaching us. So we might get a little bit of that in tonight's program. Our guest is Father Daniel Bowen. So not only is he a former Jehovah Witness, but he's wearing a white habit. And we'll find more about his uh, work in the Mercedarian Brothers, Mercedarian fathers? Friars, sure. Yes. All right. Brothers, please. Thanks, Marcus. Father Daniel, it's great to have you here. Great to have you here. Come down from Cleveland. Wow, All right. the way. All the way. <laughs> <laughs> now, a very delightful trip, especially around this time of the year with the in the fall time with the different colors that's, of the leaves. That's yeah. right, a beautiful wonderful. time. Of course, it's beautiful up there by the river, by the lake, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah well, let, let me step back and let's hear your story. Okay. Where should we begin? Probably at the all the way back. All the way back. Uh, what were your earliest, earliest, how, uh, earliest religious recollections? How did it begin? Yes. So just to kind of give a little detail, um, my mother has been a Jehovah Witness my entire life. Uh, she, I think maybe a year or two ago, was happy to report 50 years of being a Jehovah Witness. So wow. my entire lifetime, she'd been a Jehovah Witness. Before that, I believe she was a Methodist, if I'm not mistaken. Oh. Um, and uh, she married my father, who came from kind of a mixed religion background himself. His father had been an Orthodox Jew uh, who married a, a non-Jew. And in the 1920s, you, you just really didn't do that. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, when they married, uh, you know, my father coming kind of from a mixed faith background, um, and I did come to find out that he was baptized at some point. I did find after his passing a baptismal record with like a pilgrim congregational church or something hmm. of that nature. Um, but at some point, my mother embraced Jehovah Witness. Your dad didn't? He did not. Okay. So I didn't live in the pure Jehovah Witness family upbringing, what they would want as the ideal with both parents being Jehovah Witnesses. Mm -hmm. My father, a man of, you know, uh, of his generation, was the breadwinner. He worked the job at Ford Motor Company, mm -hmm. uh, brought home the, the bacon, as they used to say, right? <laughs> um, and I, certainly, I, I do believe he had uh, uh, believed in God. You know, uh, he never went to church in my memory or recollection mm -hmm. or synagogue or anything of that nature. Um, but um, certainly loved his family, happy to provide, loved the Cleveland Indians, you know, <laughs> right, and, and these things. But, you know, certainly provide for the family, was there for us. And so basically the religious upbringing was left to my mother, you know. In uh, our family was five. I have two brothers, my older brother David, uh, who is mentally challenged, right, and mm -hmm. has been uh, his whole life. And a younger brother, about a little over a year uh, uh, younger than myself, uh, Ron. And uh, so the three of us uh, were raised and brought to the Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall, which is their house of worship, right? Um, and so my earliest memories of the faith and of God and all of that would have been found in the Kingdom Hall. Uh, so I can remember journeying there and, you know, being... Being present, we would go there quite frequently. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, you know, I never thought of anything different. I didn't know anything, but mm -hmm. you know, you'd be going three times a week, you know, during the weeknight. And mm -hmm. uh, if, an, if a if an average Protestant were to drop into a Jehovah Witness, would the worship and be similar? I I don't know. It's a kind of a strange place if you've never been in a Kingdom Hall. You know, they not. tend to like to build these places. They look more like a conference room. Okay. Uh, there is kind of a little stage area, but that's mi mainly just for the minister to be able to, uh, you know, speak from a, a higher right. area. Uh, and and in our day when we first started, it was an upright piano, and they had their own songs. Okay. Nothing borrowed from any Catholic or Protestant tradition of their own songs and music, that you know would be played on this piano, so kind of old school. Most of the songs seem to have been written around the 1920s, so they had that kind of a feel. Yeah. And uh, I can remember my, my grandfather on my father's side, who was, of course, Jewish, he could play piano. That's how he met my grandmother. He gave her some piano lessons and <laughs> fell in love. But uh, he uh, remember playing the music, and he liked it because I think it, it reminded him of the 20s and that vibe. But um, so going there, I just remember um, different types of things that they do be role playing, some of the practicing. OK, when you when you knock on the door, you know, and they say that they're Catholic, how do you respond to that and mm -hmm. things that and as, as children, they would let, you know, of course, we'd be going door to door with them. So they would, you know, often try to encourage us, you know, if, if 
if somebody says this, uh, what, what kind of, what would you want, how would you want to answer, you know, uh, you know, and then they might give you a cookie or different things of that. But for faith, I can remember my mother, especially at bedtime, you know, when you're young, it can be kind of a, a scary moment to go to bed and sleep and there's monsters in the closet, you know, typical things as a child you might think. But I remember my mother always uh, reading from a, from the scriptures, right? The New World Translation, their their Bible, and um, and uh, and staying in the chair until we'd fallen asleep, uh, you know. Just <laughs> just good memories of that nature, and you know, uh, they the witnesses had produced, of course, their own little book, my my book of Bible stories that had, you know, um, I haven't looked at one of these books in years, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you're going to be introduced to the figures of Noah and Adam and Eve, and you know. Uh, all the all the figures that we're going to find in the Old Testament, probably some of the new. I don't know exactly how they portray them all, but right. um, you know, as a child, I firmly believed, uh, you know, as Jehovah God, as God, um, and uh, that, um, and of course, for the witness view, um, if there's any hope for a salvation, it is only through the Jehovah Witness organization. <laughs> there is no salvation outside of that organization. So it was imperative for, for myself as a young one and looking to, to grow into the faith to be aware that everyone else who's a non-witness is really under the influence of the evil one and to be very cautious about my relations with, with non-witness, uh, non-witnesses. And of course, as a child, uh, you know, this would manifest itself. Of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses only believe that one holiday should be celebrated. They believe that Jehovah God has sanctioned what they call their memorial service, which occurs once a year uh, around the time of the Jewish Passover and, mm-hmm. and for us as, as Catholics or Christians, uh, Easter time. And um, so in school, I would not take part in any kind of parties. I can still remember mm-hmm. we were going to have Valentine's Day, and so we in elementary school, constructed a little like mailbox like thing so we could put the Valentines in, you know, for our party and everyone would exchange them. And I remember making that, but then when it came time for the actual event, I was not present. I was not, no, it was not, so I, w- I would leave. Uh, birthdays, we did not celebrate birthdays, no. Um, even in school, when we would stand, you know, for the Pledge of Allegiance, we would not place our hand on the heart. So right from the beginning, you already feel yourself set apart from others, you know, and that's. Um, who, who, who was Jesus? Ah, there you have it. Who is Jesus, right? A perfect man, but not God. <laughs> so definitely not the 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 true, uh, the truth really. It, and his death, resurrection. There you have it, right? All acts by of Jehovah God, right? Because He yeah. is the all, oh, okay. the all being there. So you would have accepted his death and resurrection, but it was just all pointing to Jehovah as the active. That's it. Yeah, okay. very much like that. Uh, you know, they don't believe in the Trinity. They don't see God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what I think a lot of people don't understand is that they're truly not Christian. Uh, they, I think, well, if you, you encountered a witness and asked them, they say, oh, yes, we certainly are, because they do have some kind of understanding yeah. of Christ. But I think part of being a Christian is acknowledging Jesus, obviously, as God, and, and they certainly do yeah. not do that. It, it's, a, it's a form of Arianism, you know, that he's this perfect man, um, but no more than a perfect man. And, and that's a, that is a really neat point to make, and that is, it's really an old heresy brought, brought. so if you lose, as Newman said, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Well, if you forget history, you're just going to make the same mistakes all over again. Absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. Sacraments? Uh, well, for them, no concept of that whatsoever at all. Yeah. Um, they do believe in a, in a baptism, okay? Baptism for the Jehovah Witness is different. Um, uh, for baptism for Jehovah Witnesses usually would take place at their circuit assemblies. These would be um, usually annually or biannual gatherings that might be held in a sports arena or some large venue where all the area Jehovah Witnesses would converge and gather. And if your name had been submitted for you to, to be baptized, they would have a full swimming pool. So they believed in full immersion. Um, but full immersion for adults only. Mm-hmm. So really the thrust was for once you have been fully indoctrinated and accepted the truth uh, mm-hmm. uh, of the Jehovah Witness organization, uh, you would then be baptized. And they would, you know, I can still remember as a <laughs> kid seeing, you know, the people in their bathing suits at the certain point of the assembly gathering and, and you know, bringing up and, and then, but they don't baptize in the Trinitarian formula, see. Yeah, okay. So uh, it, as far as, the church would consider it, it's not a valid baptism. Hmm. 
Um, uh, they've, they've changed the formula, and the intention is obviously not quite the same. Are, are all adult Jehovah's Witnesses eventually baptized, or is that limited to those who might be the 144,000? Uh, <laughs> well, my understanding is, is that, and again, their, their teachings do change, Marcus, so, you know, not really having been yeah. in touch with them for since the mid-'80s, um, things could be different, yeah, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, but the goal is for, for you as a, to become a Jehovah's Witness, to have any hope of really uh, an eternal life, you needed to be baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. See, they don't believe in the immortality of the soul, Marcus. So when you die, you die. Huh. So, so important for you, to be, for you and for me as a witness to try to help you so that you could become a Jehovah's Witness because they believe that, um, um, you know, Jesus invisibly returned to earth around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century and he surveyed all the world religion, including Catholicism, and found them all wanting. But there was only one faith that kept the truth and the true faith and that was a Jehovah Witness organization founded by Charles Taze Russell. And so, the Jehovah Witness organization is the sole intermediary between God and mankind. And he's coming back soon, so we need to be ready to be right with Jehovah God. If we're not a Jehovah Witness, that's it. It's, that's it for you. If you are a Jehovah Witness, there is the possibility for two possibilities for you for eternal life. If you're a faithful slave and have done the field ministry and put in the hours and have contributed out of your own uh, earnings to the organization, uh, there is the possibility that you could be one of the 144,000 that get to live and reign in heaven with Jesus. Okay, however, obviously I think we can say since the foundation of this organization in 1873 till now, probably have exceeded that number, we should hope or think, right? So what happens to the rest? Oh, we've got a wonderful second prize for you. You get to live on a renewed paradise earth. God will recreate the earth without disease or sickness or famine, and you yourself will be recreated with a perfect body <laughs> where the lion lays with the lamb and the child plays on the adder's den using the Isaiah imagery yeah. to be this paradise earth. So the great majority of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, will live on this paradise earth. But the third option is the rest of us, we won't be in either of those places. You, you will cease to exist, correct. All right. Our guest is Father Daniel Bowen. Uh, so as a young man, you believe this? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. But you know, I was shocked one time, I remember going to some kind of a, a picnic that we had for the for the congregation, and uh, and again these types of events are meant to be just with other witnesses. As a general witness, you are meant to not associate with non-witnesses as much as possible, so that their worldly worldview and influence does not affect you or tempt you or possibly lead you to question or or forbid, God forbid, uh, have you to leave the Jehovah Witness organization. Because if you do, you might end up a Catholic in a white robe. <laughs> <laughs> God, only God can, in his great divine plan, could ever imagine such incredible things. But I remember being at a picnic one time and there was a, another younger kid, I think he, he was around my same age, but he went to a different school and that, so I didn't know him too much outside of just the Jehovah Witness thing. And I remember we were playing something. I remember he kept swearing. He had this foul mouth and he was using all this language and I was like, how could he be using this language? Doesn't he realize that, you know, that he's a witness? We, we don't speak in this way. So, you know, some of the reality began to kind of set in that maybe things aren't as they're supposed to be, you know. And then, you know, I, I didn't really, and again, I probably because my father not being there, mm. you know, he, you know, he didn't hold up that end of, no, no, this is it. So once I got to be around the age of 12 or 13, you know, I, I kind of said, well, you know, I, I, I don't really want to go to the Kingdom Hall, you know. And of course, this, of course, broke my mother's heart. But, I, you know, but I was like, you know, this this bribe of a cheeseburger, you know, after the hall, you know, <laughs> at the newly McDonald's, it was built down the road. It, it's just not going to work for me anymore. And my father was basically, you know, if he doesn't want to go, he shouldn't have to go. So that was the beginning of my departure from the Jehovah Witness organization. And then in high school, I befriended uh, you know, my, my close circle of friends was a Coptic Orthodox Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, 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 
X, XYZ Protestant, uh, you know, a, a, a Roman Catholic. So we all kind of just hung out together. And, you know, for us was, uh, you know, rock and roll would be the way to go. You know, that's, that's, that's the answer. Religion was a part of the discussion. It's not really at all. You yeah. know, we kind of all, I think, either marginally or, or debunked or went through the motions in our parents' churches. And, but then when we came together, you know, it was, you know, otherwise. So how long were you in that? A cloud of darkness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and certainly I still had a belief of God. Um, and and I, I can still remember a point in my life thinking of, you know, I should be taking up that mantle and really doing that door to door and doing God's work full time. But I just I just can't yeah. see it, you know. So went on to college, you know, and then um, I just it was a secular university. I won't name names, but the research could probably be done. But I know there, you know, I was most definitely taught that God is unnecessary. You know, we were, of course, yeah. course, in our courses, told to read Joseph Campbell and his book, explaining how these are all myths yes. that are made up, that are kind of archetypes that are used to just control and manage people and that. And I kind of went along with all that stuff, yeah. Marcus. You know, my, yeah. my undergrad college years were really a time of great darkness. Mm -hmm. You know, I really you know, had no faith. And I can remember my mom still, you know, mailing to me the Awake and Watchtower magazines wrapped up in their little thing. And I remember maybe opening one, reading one and just whatever. And then when they just started coming, I would just throw them away. Yeah. I didn't even open them, you know, yeah. but it was her attempt to try to, you know, but meanwhile, I was going to be about getting a career, uh, you know, uh, playing a guitar, becoming a rock star. So they'll get all the girls and all the money. And I'll be able to say, you know, what I want to say and, and all that kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of the, the philosophy uh, that I was embracing. Uh, I do remember that there was an, a, an evangelical Christian. Uh, his name is Charlie. And if he's listening, uh, you know, thank you. He <laughs> did reach out to me in the midst of that and said, hey, you know, we're having a little Bible study. And I remember going to the Bible study and Everything I heard made a lot of good sense in that, but I was completely a know-it-all. Because again, with the witnesses, we believe we really know and nobody else does. So after attending that maybe once or twice, I was like, whatever. But I need to give me uh, an NIV. And I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I held on to that. And when I kind of came the around. The international version. You know, it, 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 the yeah, Bible, the yeah. new international version. And with tabs on it, very useful and necessary <laughs> and helpful. So that did go in the drawer. Not to be touched again for some years, but but there it was. Uh, so what what happened? How did Catholicism come about? Yeah. In the neighborhood where I grew up in, Mayfield Heights, uh, east side suburb of Cleveland, most people I would say were, were either um, Italian Catholic or or Jewish. That seemed to be the predominant groups in there. So Catholicism wasn't a completely foreign concept. I can still remember my neighbors a couple doors down. How on Fridays they would not no bologna sandwiches. You know it's Lent. And that, and, and you know, I still remember also around this makes me think of our, our timing here Halloween, you know. Well, you should go out and trick or treat our mom. Oh, yes, yes. So she found some costumes. I got my younger brother and I up in the costumes, and we went from to the next door neighbor, and the next door was our house. And of course, my mom, no, no, and yeah, so that we weren't going any further than that. <laughs> but, um, but the way that I became Catholic was I ended up dating a Catholic girl. That's how that happened in my uh, last year of college. Uh, I was smitten in love with this with this girl, Elizabeth, and uh, you know she said, you know, if, if you're going to be with me, we go to mass. And she was insistent, you know, we go to and her mother was they were we go to mass. So okay, so I started going to mass, <laughs> and then she introduced me to. Now, what did you think about that your first time in? Yeah, good question. Yeah, <laughs> well, certainly the scripture, you know, the the, the word being proclaimed. Um, I'd heard these things before. So that that wasn't, you know, that actually was really very beautiful because I felt, mm, you know, it didn't seem foreign to me. And, and there was a sense of, of peace that I noticed there in the assembly and going there. And uh, so the, I, it left us a great impression that, mm. you know, here's a place of, that doesn't seem, and I'd never, well, I do take that back. I was in a Catholic church one time before, years before I'd forgotten about it, but one of my best friends was Catholic, and one time I went with him, and ultimately I ended up being the same church that I ended up being baptized and confirmed and actually ordained in, <laughs> St. Gregory the Great in South Euclid. But any which case, for all intents and purposes, I hadn't really, you know, been to a Catholic church, and, and we started going out regularly. Okay. And then she uh, said, this is also this thing called adoration. And the, the, the church had its own adoration chapel. 
And so she explained to me, you know, that the bread, you know, when it's consecrated by the priest, becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Not a symbol, but truly him, his presence. Which and, would have been 180 degrees from anything you'd had right. witness yet. <laughs> sure. But, uh, and then they place in the monstrance, you know, and then you could, you could actually spend time in his presence. So I went with her to adoration and, you know, that it was one of those where you have a little door and you can open it and shut it, you know. So we went and did that and everything. And I just remember just the great sense of, of peace that I found there, you know. I loved her. But there was something much more deeper going on here uh, in my experience at Mass and in the Adoration Chapel. So really, um, I would say it's the Eucharist, right? <laughs> now, for her and I, we, it didn't last for us. We ended up breaking up. Um, but uh, but uh, she did kind of make it clear to me. She was like, you know, if you were ever going to be serious with me, you should, be, you should think about becoming Catholic. So the invitation was laid and put there. So, hmm, you know. Maybe I should look into this. Yeah. Maybe I should look into this. So I remember uh, RCIA, I was told, which is the right of Christian initiation of adults. Uh, and so I remember she went with me, went to her church and going to the RCIA meeting. And, uh, and we attended, we sat through the meeting. At the end, the one organizer came up and he said, oh, hi, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. This and that. Uh, you know, if you're looking to enter the church, you know, this coming Easter vigil, I'm so sorry you missed a couple sessions. So that, that probably wouldn't be possible, but you're welcome to stay here and be present. So I remember, I don't know anything. I'm like, well, okay, whatever. And I remember my girlfriend, God bless her. She's like, that's a load of BS. Come on, <laughs> come on with me. We're going to go to the other church, which is more cool. St. Gregory the Great, we're going to go there. So we went there and I remember um, Father Francis Van Bergen, God rest him, a beautiful, uh, a, a wonderful example of a holy, joy-filled priest. Uh, we went to the, the, the parish there and uh, explained to him, you know, that I was looking interested in looking into the Catholic faith, and he was like, oh, "That's fine, wonderful, good. We, we're meeting. We've met a couple of sessions, but we can make you up. We meet this day, this time." So there's a group of six of us that be, began <laughs> gathering, and uh, so I began to go. I think uh, my girlfriend maybe went to the maybe the first, and that was it, you know, because we were broken up. It was one of these soft breakups, so she still appear you know, in my life in that, but but it certainly began to me, so I began to go. But you kept going. I kept going. I, I had to keep going. There was just something there that was uh -huh. deep and um, that was attractive and that I'd never really experienced before. Uh, so then in the midst of my, of my going through our CIA, um, my father died. In retrospect, it shouldn't have been um, a surprise. Mm. He began having heart issues and heart problems. Well, even while I was in college, he had these heart attacks periodically. And so I guess it became kind of normal to think, oh, he's going to have a heart attack and then he'll pull through or this and that. So I was at home at the time. And I remember I was watching a, a television show called Quantum Leap. I'm dating myself with these things. But I remember uh, he'd leapt into Lee Harvey Oswald. So it was, you know, something that you're going to watch because it's, you know, tied it with reality. And uh, so I remember watching the show and just at the point where he's shooting John F. Kennedy, right, who's a Catholic, huh? with connections, right? <laughs> I heard the sound of a, 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 just a loud thud. And normally, you know, my father, when you, when you'd be a loud thud or something, anything that was un normal, you hear him go, hey, what's that? Or, oh, what, what, what? you know, some kind of noise. And I heard no response. So my attention is kind of turning away from that towards this. And I'm like, so I'm dad. I don't hear a response, dad. And uh, so I, I, I get up, I turn around, and he's laying, he's laying on, the, on the floor there mm -hmm. in the house. And so I called 911, got a pulse and all that. And uh, wow. um, I, I still remember, um, we, we did take him to the hospital, but I still remember our cat, we had a cat in the house looking at my dad while the CPR, the paramedics were working on him. And the cat's doing one of these things. He's looking at my dad, and the cat goes like this. To me, that's yeah. the moment of my dad part. But, but we went to the hospital <laughs> with the medications and everything, and they took us in the special room. And uh, for me, it was, it was very devastating, Marcus, because I was very close to my dad. I remember I was the first in my family to go to college, and he mm -hmm. always, always had the greatest faith and confidence that I would succeed and do well in life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, like a lot of fathers from that generation, you, you sometimes it, you always wish there was more intimacy, yeah. more time. but the work and the life gets on. But I can still remember one 
one uh, great memory that was not too long before uh, his passing, where we were driving back from a restaurant, you know, and uh, he said to me, he said, son, do you remember the time that you called me a loser? And when he said it, I, I, had, I, had, I actually didn't remember ever calling him a loser, and I wasn't sure where he was going with this conversation, you know. And, um, and uh, he was explaining to me what, what the circumstances was. Yeah. And, and it came to me what it was. I remember in health class, I think it was in eighth grade, they talked to us about people that, uh, that drink excessively are losers. And my father was a functional alcoholic. In his later years, he was able to kick the habit, but for many years, when I wanted to find my dad, I got on my bicycle and went to Harry's Cafe to find him, you know? So, do you remember the time that you called me a loser? And he said, you were right. You were right about it. And I'm sorry that I wasn't there for you. Wow. So, and then maybe a couple months after that, he passed. So, it really... Uh, and in a reflection, and then when they told the news that he'd passed, I remember going into the, the room where they, you know, where his body was lying on the table and holding his hand and just screaming at my, uh, my mother and then my, my girlfriend, you know, of course, found out and they were all out there and they, she was explaining how people heard me crying out because I'm like, how could you leave me, daddy, if I, you know, mm-hmm. where, you know, it was, uh, you know, when you lose a father, at any age it's difficult. But. Well, I remember when my father passed, both my parents had passed, that I don't think I realized how much it would affect me mm-hmm. until it happened. I had no idea that it would have such an impact. So right. I know what you're talking yeah. about, Father Daniel. I remember, I would say it took me a year to quit getting uh, choked up whenever that I is talk exactly about my it. dad. Cause about he, a year, yes. It took me about that long. And, uh, and uh, remembering all those times I wish I had said this or that or... How much yeah. more I wish we'd have talked about this or that, yes. and uh, so in some ways, that experience that your dad did with you was a great gift oh of my God goodness, before yes. to, yes. to affirm you in that way, but also his way of saying I'm sorry. Absolutely you know, right. Praise God. Why don't we let's pause there? Let's okay, pause sounds we'll, good. We'll take a time for a break, and we'll come back in a bit and pick up on Father Dan Bowen's story. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Father Daniel Bowen, uh, former, former Jehovah Witness, and, and make sure it, that I get it in, in case we run out of time, is uh, Father's uh, a, a member of the Vocations Director, right? That's correct. Of, of the Mercedarians. Mercedarian Friars USA. Mercedarian Friars USA, and uh, his website is orderofmercy.org, just in case you're interested to find out more about them. All right, for the, Father Daniel, Let's let's pick up. We've uh, we've shared. Uh, we know we we both shared the loss yes. of our fathers and how big of an impact that was in our spiritual journey. Did that have a big impact for you at the time on moving forward in your oh absolutely spiritual journey? it did. You know, in a sense of really, um, my earthly father passed the reins mm. back to the heavenly father. Mm. That's really what occurred there, and so and and again, you know, of course, when there's a death, there's that questioning why, why. But I was in the perfect place. Because Father Frank had answers. The Catholic Church had explanations and reason. And, and they were there with me, mm-hmm. partnering, you know, uh, walking through the grief, you know, and accompanying me in that. So, and the more I began to learn and things made sense, the connections were there. Uh, again, that peace, that joy, that love that uh, is there. Uh, I had no hesitation mm-hmm. uh, when on Easter Vigil of 1994 at St. Gregory the Great Parish, I was baptized, confirmed, and received first Eucharist, <laughs> and uh, a glorious day. I can remember, you know, all my friends coming, uh, whether they understood or not or whatever, uh, they came along. Although my mother did not come, I was wonder. My mother did not come. And the Jehovah Witnesses are banned, forbidden from setting foot in any other house of worship. Hmm. As a matter of fact, it extends even further than that. They're even forbidden from praying with non-witnesses. Oh. So hmm. it, it, often it is considered a cult. And in many senses, it, it does have the marks of that, mm. uh, which Catholicism is quite the opposite completely, mm. right? So we can talk about uh, some of the differences, you know. Uh, 
You know, one thing that struck struck me as you comparison. Now you're baptized and all that. Yeah, is I the I, I wondered the idea that you knew you had a soul. <laughs> yes, right. Right, and then there absolutely, was, and in the afterlife, and and if our cat didn't teach that with my father, I, I don't, you know, <laughs> right. But that idea and that promise and that uh, re- receiving of the Eucharist and uh, the sacrament of confession, having these two lines that after that, that um, that that cleansing, you know, mm. of the the baptism, you know, being becoming a son in the Son, um, having those two supports there to keep you on your journey, to keep you fed and healthy spiritually uh, just became essential. Um, now, uh, I do have to confess after, you know, I did find another cat, the girl to date, and we dated for a time that didn't work out. I began to really embrace myself in, career, in my career. I worked for Progressive Auto Insurance for nine years. That became my career. I went uh, from insurance then ultimately to blessed assurance, but, <laughs> <laughs> but for a while there I'd fallen away and, and began to embrace the life of you know, if I just buy this, I will be happy. Mm. And I'm making the money and really working and focusing on uh, my, my, my career and my, uh, what I want and drifted away from yeah. the faith, sadly. And uh, I got to a point where, you know, there was, there was I w- again, was not going to church and not frequenting the sacraments. Oh. Mm. And um, so what, what brought me back, oddly enough, God sent me a, a good friend who um, uh, was... Uh, uh, for a time, they're really into, into UFOs and, and, and ghosts and that, and she always wanted to l- investigate these things. And, you know, we'd periodically like, meet for coffee, you know, once a month or whatever, a couple weeks or whatever. And so she, she finally got the man of her dreams. And so her and her boyfriend went in search of these things and stuff. Oh, okay, whatever. And then I did, I, you know, and every time I'd see her, she just seemed to be more like d- pale and withdrawn and just kind of morose mm-hmm. in a way. Then I didn't hear from her for two or three months. And she called me, hey, do you want to go up for, yeah, okay. So we got together and now she was uplifting and bright and happy and joy filled. And I'm like, what's, what's going on with you? How are things with you and your boyfriend? And she's like, oh, we had to break up, you know. And so she explained to me how, you know, they went investigating these things. And at one place there was something choking her. She could not see it, but she could feel it. Hmm. And so she knew that the spiritual realm and these ghosts were for real. But thanks be to God, hmm. her uh, employer uh, introduced her to the Assemblies of God Church, and she is saved, and I should be saved too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I don't think so. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to have any of that. But we still continue to meet, and every time she'd meet, she had the Bible in her hand, and she was so positive and so upbeat. You know, come on. No, no, no. She was persistent, right? Yeah. And so eventually... After I don't know how many visits, coffee runs. She's like, "You gotta come. It's Easter." And I said, "Okay." And I remember in just even speaking, "Okay," there was a sense of peace that came over me again. Hmm. So she, "Okay, we'll pick. I'll pick you up at seven o'clock. We'll go. I'll bring you there." So so that evening, what's on television? Now at this point in my life, I spent most nights by myself. Mm. not really socializing, just kind of in this isolated environment, concentrating on my work and what I thought was important in that. So it wasn't unusual to find me on a Saturday evening watching PBS, you know. <laughs> so I hate commercials, you know, very difficult. But I know sometimes a necessary evil. <laughs> <laughs> so what was, on, what was on the screen? Ben-Hur. <laughs> Ben-Hur. Now, I studied, uh, my major was uh, telecommunications at my university. So I remember we had a film class, and they said, Ben-Hur, you need to watch for the chariot race scene. That is significant. And I'd never seen the movie before. So I'm like, I'm going to watch a movie for this chariot race scene. And let me tell you, I really entered in that movie. Yeah. I related with Ben-Hur. And for those who know the story, don't know the story, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really his journey of faith and coming yeah. to Christ. Yeah. Uh, but throughout the whole film, he resists it and pushes it away, and it can't be. And I've got to get revenge on this guy who killed my family. Oh, he didn't kill my family. Oh, they're in leprechaun. Oh, they're cured from lepers. Anyway, ultimately, he, he, he comes, to, comes to faith. And I remember the, the film ending. And, and the charity scene, yes, it was glorious. But more wonderful was this man who, who uh, had found Christ. And the credits are rolling, and this this fluttery feeling was was there again. Hmm. Hmm. So next morning, she brought me, came, and she was true to her word, came, picked me up, went to the Assemblies of God Church, uh, which was held in my middle school gym, because after they become a certain size, it's time to, to begin a new church. And they were in that stage of, of building their church. So I went there, 
And, you know, thanks be to God for the God who never gives up on us and use all means necessary to keep reaching out to us. So in that Assemblies of God worship, in the midst of the worship, the great praise music and the message, God gave me a signal grace, a particular grace for me in that time, in that moment, which I knew beyond a shadow of doubt that God the Father loves me and that he loves me as a son in his son, Jesus Christ, in, with, in the Holy Spirit. And it, it, my whole world was changed, I mean, it, absolutely, in a whole d- deeper way mm. that had already been the sage was set in the Catholic Church, but hadn't really sunk down. Mm. I knew it, and I hungered for Scripture like I had never before in my life, Marcus. Mm. So when they gave me a copy of the New Testament, and they said, well, it, it, you know, I devoured it. You know, read the Bible in a year. And I'm checking, I'm reading, I'm like, wow. I'm making connections that I'd never made before. And then when they invited me to, to read Rick Warren's, uh, you know, the, the Purpose Driven Life with a small group sharing at, at someone's basement, um, I was on fire. Hmm. There was no turning back. And, you know, the, I was, now I'm carrying the Bible and talking about Jesus and uplifted. <laughs> and the Spirit was definitely alive in, the, in that assembly and those people. So then another friend of mine noticed this big change in me, and he'd been a friend for many years, and he says, hmm, so what's going on with you? So I explained, you know, this, you know, going to this church and, you know, uh, having a personal relationship with Jesus and all that. He says, would you be interested in, in going on a retreat? Now, I'd never been on a retreat. I don't know if that wasn't part of our CIA or maybe I missed it. I, I'm not sure. But anyway, I, I looked retreat and it eluded me. So I said, if it's about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen, I will do it. And they said, okay, it's called Teens Encounter Christ. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know, I'm not a teen. <laughs> it's okay. It's for teens, but also adults can go. So I went on the weekend. And let me tell you, again, if you thought things <laughs> couldn't go to a deeper, more profound, beautiful level, yes. Teens Encounter Christ, uh, it's a movement I think it started in, up in maybe Madison, Wisconsin, in 65, right. kind of a Crucio model. Three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's what I was wondering if it was kind of like her seal. Yeah, it's yeah. like that. Oh, and so, yeah. yes. So I went to confession. I hadn't been confession in a very long time. And there were some doozies. <laughs> but it was one of these confessions. When I walked out of the confessional, I was floating. The burden I could feel lifted off. And they had in the midst of that week an adoration and the praise and worship, just like I'd learned at the Assemblies of God. Those anointed songs, you know, that mm-hmm. really... Teach, touch the soul deeply, and I'm with all these other faithful. And in the midst of it, I, I, God spoke to me again in, in the Eucharist, in the moment, this is where you belong. <laughs> this is where you're supposed to be. There's so many grace moments. Uh, one of the retreatants that I was with, he's a junior in high school, much younger than me. He's a Catholic priest now, you know, for the <laughs> diocese, and he's studying in Rome to further studies to, uh, you know, I just uh, in another uh, young uh, she just graduated from high school, and I remember there was a moment in the retreat where the, everything planned for was done. It was before retirement, and uh, she came to me, and she's like, well, would you like to pray the rosary with me? Now, I was a little embarrassed because, I mean, I'd learned it, but I'd never really kind of prayed the rosary, and she kind of sensed that, and she's like, it's okay. We, we usually do it with my family and in the evening. I, I can help. So we, we sat, and we prayed the rosary together. Um, uh, just... So many amazing things. So after that retreat, I was on a, on a, if I thought the Assemblies of God was a high, this was beyond that high. So now for, for a time, for a period of two or three months, I, I'm going to, I'm going to set up the Assemblies of God Church in the gymnasium, then leaving right when worship begins to go to attend Mass and coming back and taking things apart. And I remember eventually the associate pastor caught on. He's like, you know, I just, I haven't really seen you. Uh, and so I explained to him, I said, look, I'm in, I'm in going to the Catholic Church. And, and um, he was really a very beautiful soul, I, uh, mm. I have to say. And, and he said, you know, and he wasn't any way mean or threatening about it. He said, so what's, what's, you know, we have here good worship and you've made friends here and, and all this. And I, I said, the Eucharist. And he said, he said, okay. Mm. It was just like that. You know, there wasn't, so that gave me the permission. So now I'm at my own parish lecturing, doing this. And then I'm looking at the bulletin and I'm like, my, my goodness, you go to Mass every day. Do you know that you can go to Mass every day? Hear the word proclaimed and receive the most holy Eucharist? Blew my mind completely. I, I couldn't believe it. So now I'm going to daily Mass. And God just gave me these different insights. And 
One time the priest holding up the chalice. And I remember looking into the chalice and seeing in the chalice all of us seated in the chapel in the reflection. We are all one. You know, just different things like that. And then people asked me if I thought about the priesthood and these different types of things. Um, and I hadn't, right? I didn't really know it. It wasn't my background or understanding. But the more I began to bring that to prayer, the more that became something that mm. uh, seemed possible and ultimately became something that I really felt that God was, in fact, mm. calling me to do. Yeah. So there's a whole story there, of course. But Well, um, we've still got 15 minutes. I, I would like to, to know how you sense the call to the order you're in. I mean, that was that common oh. where you were? Or, uh, did you become a priest first and then the order? Or how did that work out for you? Well, for me, I felt, uh, and again, everybody's story is a little bit different on discerning the call. I felt uh, calling to the priesthood before I felt, uh, in the sense, religious life or mm. particularly the Mercedarian friars. Um, so I'd gone to a come and see weekend once I kind of got around to the saying, yeah, this could be a possibility and I learned about the diocese. And I remember just being with the guys that came on this retreat weekend and with the diocese and I was like, come on guys, we can do this. This is awesome. We can be the, the ones that make the difference in, in bringing Christ to the masses and, and helping them in that. And I just remember some of the guys can be like, eh, I don't know. You know, I was like, I was like, come on, you know, I don't know. I like that camaraderie. So I remember we, we had an apologetic group was meeting. There was, I'd become, again, any opportunity I could get to, to grow the faith. Um, we were meeting, I think, twice a week at a nearby parish. And uh, so we, one evening, uh, the topic was the Mass. And, and one of our regular attendees brought along a priest. And he was in Roman collar, you know, black with a little white. And uh, so we're like, well, Father, you know, our topic's the Mass and we we're going to present, but, you know, you're here, you're a priest and Mass priest. Would you speak, you know, uh, on the topic? He's like, no, no. Like, come on. So we had to we had to nudge him a little bit. But once we got him, he, he said, okay, he like stood up, he got the marker, marker board. Here's what the mass is. Boom, boom. But here's what the mass is not. Boom. Everything very systematically organized, well explained, no gobbledygook. Sad to say at that point in our diocese, there was a lot of gobbledygook. Hmm. And that's why we had an apologetics group. So we could really know our hmm. faith, study it deeply, and be prepared to give the reason for our hope. Yeah. And uh, so... I was just wowed by him because he was just wow. And then after our meeting that went one hour, went two hours. And I remember one of the uh, ladies attending, you know, she and she was a mother with young kids. It was a school night, but she's like, Father, would you hear my confession? He said, yeah, absolutely. And they went, you know, where they, they didn't even have confessions in the church. But they, you know, so I was like, who is this guy? Usually a priest is like, oh, well, confessions are Saturday between, uh, you know, three and three ten. You know, he just dropped everything and heard her confession. I was like, oh, wow. So when he came back uh, after the confession, I said, Father, you know, I'm thinking about being a priest. And I can remember he looked me straight in the eye and his eyes are like piercing through my soul. And he said, how serious are you about being a priest? Are you willing to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters in Christ? And that just, I was like, whoa, yeah, that's what it is all about, hmm. right? being like Christ. So I come later to find out that he's with the Mercedarian Friars. He'd been, uh, which has a presence in Cleveland at a different parish uh, on the other side of town. And he'd been to visit. And we found he was giving a retreat out in Leroy, New York, where our community has a, a place. So the, the, we were all so taken by him that we journeyed out for the weekend retreat. And again, uh, everything explained clearly. You know, he talked about Thomas Aquinas, right? And he talked about, you know, in our whole, Euch uh, whole weekend was around the Eucharist and the liturgy of the hours. And we prayed with the friars and, you know, and I just, uh, everything just hit home and clicked in a way. And I just felt a sense of home and belonging here which I did in the church overall, the Catholic Church, which I didn't in the Jehovah Witness organization, but even more so in this Mercedarian group. So ultimately, as I discerned, this, this was the order that really kept popping up. And so when the time was right and I knew it was time to make the move, that's where I applied. And so in 2006, in the fall, yep, I made the application, they accepted. And uh, so, you know, gave the car to my mom, here's the keys to the house. <laughs> Off we go to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to begin formation both as a mercenary and friar and as a, a priest candidate. Hmm. Yes. And now you're vocations director. How do you like that, right? God <laughs> works in mysterious ways. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to make sure, I got an email, but I'm going to just pause it now because I've got 10 minutes. I want to make sure that I think a lot of, a lot of Americans, American Catholics are not as familiar with the mercedarians. You know, give, give us a little a snapshot on, on history Oh, yeah. But also a fourth vow, right? Be glad to. Yes, we, we take a unique fourth vow that only our order takes. 
Uh, we are an order proper. We were founded back in the time of the establishment of orders versus congregations or associations of the faithful. Uh, we were uh, founded in the time of the 1200s. This time, Islam was coming into Spain and invading. And again, often is the case when is Islamic person would meet a person, are you Islam? If the answer is yes, okay, good, fine, you're with us. If you're not, now I give you the option of A, you either become Islam, convert, or I kill you, <laughs> mm. uh, or I take you as a slave. Mm. So our founder was a merchant, and he would see these slave ships come in. Peter Nolasco was his name, Peter Nolasco. And this really broke his heart seeing these Christians in, in chains and being whipped and beaten and treated uh, uh, mm. inhuman, inhumanely. So like a good Catholic does or should do, he went to pray about this. So he went to Montserrat, a Benedictine mountains up in uh, north uh, eastern Spain. And in a moment of prayer in the evening of August 1st to August the 2nd, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to him in a vision. My son has heard your prayers, and he has sent me to tell you to establish a kingdom that will do the work of my son, set the captives free. So he went, traveled back to Barcelona, explained to King James I of Aragon what he had experienced. And King the James said, I believe you, I back you. Here's the royal coat of arms of Catalonia, Aragon. Here's the temporal approbation. He went to the bishop and said, uh, this is what he's, he's, I believe you. Come to the cathedral of Barcelona, La Cruz. Here is your ecclesial approbation. So both the temporal and ecclesial approbation on August 10th, 1218, the order of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mercy for the redemption of captives of St. Eulalia was founded now known as the Order of Mercy and all under the queenship of the Blessed Virgin Mary. <laughs> We're not in Alaskans, always Mercedarians, La Merced, which means more accurately, ransom. Hmm. And so we last year celebrated 800 years. Wow. Uh, and we're still here, always on a smaller side, maybe there's about 700 friars throughout the order, mostly all in Spanish-speaking countries. Um, we were friars that also came to the New World with Christopher Columbus on his return trip. So we've been foundation and foundational in many of the Latin American cultures, making sure that the natives were treated properly, and of course, letting them know about Jesus Christ. Um, we had never come into the United States in any significant or lasting way until the 1920s. And that came about as some of our Italian friars were in Mexico assisting the friars. The Cristeros Wars occurred. And so they had choices to make. Do we stay or we as foreign priests leave? So they came north into the United States. At that point, the Italians were still coming to America, probably from around 1870, 1940, I would say. And so here was a, uh, the immigrant that was not being treated properly, afforded their dignity and respect. And in many cases, the Italians would lose their faith or they might join one of these Episcopalian, apostolic, Catholic-like churches. Um, um, so uh, ultimately, Archbishop Bishop Schrems of Cleveland, Ohio, in 1921 said, yes, come and you can begin your order here in our diocese. Hmm. And so we did, and we are there to this day, St. Rocco's Parish and Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So, and then later in the late 40s, also moving into Buffalo, New York diocese, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, late 70s, and then into the state of Florida uh, in the 1980s. So those are the places that we're present at here in the U.S., about 24 friars right now at this point. It reminds me of that, um, the Catholic priest in World War II. Um, well, my mind is, I can't think of his name right now. I'm not, my, my helper will, okay. um, who uh, was a martyr who gave his life for a married man. Remember that? Ah, uh, yes. Maximilian Colby. Maximilian Colby. I can't be like right. Probably one of the most Marian of the of the Franciscans. But the ransom yes. idea sounds very parallel. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, sure. That's ultimately the call. And that fourth vow that we take, of course, poverty, chastity, obedience, as all consecrated religious uh, are to. But this fourth vow is a blood vow or the ransom vow, which, given the situation, you know, lay down your life or run, you lay down your life yeah. following Christ. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's awesome, Father. And uh, again, uh, Order of Mercy. Order of Mercy and the website, of course, uh, orderofmercy.org okay. to find out more information about the order and the different saints. And, and Very good. Very good. Uh, uh, and 
encourage the audience to, to check that out, especially if you're a young man and you're discerning that call. You just never know, right? Absolutely. I tell you, no regrets. No regrets. All right. We've got an email. Kelly from New York uh, writes, uh, I have some extended family members who are Jehovah Witnesses. They are very faith-filled people, and we have a good relationship. I'm wondering, though, what would be a few points of dialogue to bring up to hopefully get them to reconsider Jehovah Witness doctrine? It's very difficult because uh, as a Jehovah Witness, you're brainwashed into this is... It. This is the, the fact. They're discouraged. Like if you gave them a catechism, they could not read it. They'd put their faith in jeopardy if they read it. If they were found out that they were doing that or if they're associating with you or going to a, a, too much, this could be a cause for their disfellowshipping, which to them is mm. the most horrific thing. It means you're going to, that's it for you when you die. There's no, you're not in God's good graces as it were. I think the best, so doctrinally you're never going to win because they, they train like if we say something, they, they practice to, to mm -hmm. rebuff it. And even if it's illogical, in their mind, this is what Jehovah God has to say. And even though it makes no sense, this is it. So I think the way that you have to do it is, is through loving them. Mm -hmm. Loving them, being peaceful, uh, being joy-filled. Things that would, if you're really under the influence of the devil, you would not be able to do these things. Mm -hmm. That, I think, speaks to the heart the most. You know, for my mother, again, who, who could never accept me be becoming a Catholic, let alone becoming a Catholic priest. Mm. Um, I can't go into the whole story, but there was a moment where she almost passed away and she was in a hospital emergency room. I got the call. Uh, this is before I was a priest, just before, and uh, that she uh, had lost a tremendous loss of blood. She, her hemoglobin was two. Mm. So she was, this is it. She lost so much blood, we didn't even want to take blood just to do testing to find, they found some kind of a mass, but they didn't want to do further testing and, and she could die. And uh, she had, uh, when she came in, said, I'm a witness, do not give me blood. Well, they wanted to give her a blood transfusion to stabilize her to find out. So I arrived there and, you know, I find all the information, this is what it is. So Monday, we're going to make the big decision what to do uh, with, with her. Uh, she was unconscious, so I wasn't able to really communicate, but I came there and was by her side. And uh, so we're in the room waiting and the doctors, nurses there, I'm like, I don't know what we're waiting for. And then walks this man dressed in just like jeans and a regular like, Izod shirt. He's got a piece of paper in his hand. And he's like, I am brother so-and-so, the elder of the Jehovah Witness, and I have here signed a power of attorney form for Mrs. Jean Bowen. You will not give her blood. So I turned to him. I'm like, hi, I'm Daniel Bowen, her son. Hmm. And I said, with all due respect, you know, I know a few things about the Jehovah Witness organization. How do you predict the world's going to end on this date? And then you change it to this date and to this date. How do we know this teaching about blood's not going to change? In the meantime, are we, we're going to let my mother die here? So I, I'm starting to get a little flustered, okay, let's just say. Uh, and, of course, it, you know, so they, they decide, well, let's see what we can do. So they go to my mother and, they, and the nurses and the caregivers, and they, they, they are able to bring her to, actually. And they're like, you're in an emergency room, you've lost a lot of blood. I'm going to give you blood to stay blood. You find out what's wrong and treat you. Will you let us give you blood? And my mother says, no. So I turned to this guy and I said, okay, well, are you going to stay here by my mom's side as she dies? You say, well, I, you know, anyway, I, I, I won't say what my thoughts were, but God provided. In came the priest, right? At the perfect, I, Father, I got to talk to you. So he heard my confession <laughs> and I'm trying to explain to him, but this makes no sense. This is idiotic. They allow for organ transplants. You know, they allow for organ transplants. What's in that organ? Blood. Hello. It makes no sense. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, he said, listen, it's free will. It's her choice. And he was right. I, I was like, you're right. You're right. So then I realized, here's my mom who taught me how to walk, how to talk, how to love. And my mom's going to teach me how to die. Praise you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I took vigil at her bedside and it allowed for me to have encounters with the witnesses now at an older age and, and learn some of the thing or relearn some of the different things. So it was kind of an interesting time. She did end up pulling through. She was anointed. Uh, I had the Bishop of Youngstown praying for anybody I could find praying for, and miraculously she came through. She lived another seven years. She just passed this, this past June. But since that moment after that, there was, there was this, this break in the ice, okay? So now, you know, before, if I visited her, it was Bible throwing verses. <laughs> call no man father. <laughs> we call me father, rightly so, you know. To be that, always that tension, you know, and I would stay at the, my home parish and rectory. But then after that point, she's like, you're my son. You're my son, and, and you believe this is what God is calling you. So to me, that was, that, was, yeah. that was, and the fact that she would allow me to stay overnight, she's put the witness in jeopardy because if the witness is found out, 
but because she had been so long with their group, I don't think they were going to bother. So I, I'm thankful towards the end of her existence. And, and one, one of the last things that she said before she, she passed away, and I was able to be at her bedside as she passed uh, this past year, uh, she said to me, always remember to put God first in your life. There's the, the seed of witness of your mother. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for, for uh, joining us on this program. And oh, it's a pleasure. Witness. Thank you very much. And uh, again, those of you watching, I thank you for joining us. And I do pray that Father's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.